Welcome to Therapists Uncensored, a podcast where therapists freely speak their minds about real life matters. Welcome back to Therapist Uncensored. This is episode 17, where we're going to be talking about the biology of motivation and dropping the ball that happens right after we're motivated. I think it was a good discussion. I certainly learned some things about both why that there's times when I'm into, you know, more discipline and better self-care and other times where I just drop out and what I can do about that. So I hope you enjoy it as well. You'll be hearing Ann Kelly, Patty Allwell, and myself, Sue Marriott. Thanks for listening. We are very excited to bring a Another perspective, as we try to do, and this is about, you know, you ever tried to kind of have a new start, and then that new start kind of sputters out? Are you talking about the diet I start every Monday (laughs) after a weekend of (laughs) self-indulgence? Or I think about, you know, my kids will say like, I I, I use too much screen time. I really want to cut back on my screen time. And then I come home, the chair is in the, right in front of the TV, and they're like killing people on their game, you know? <laughs> and, and they're saying, I'm going to start. I'm going to start tomorrow. That's right. Right. Well, I, I'll quit tomorrow. Isn't there a great book about that? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so this notion of there's this high motivation to do something new and to have a transformation, whether it be social media and screen time or health or fitness or losing weight, or uh, whatever the habit is. Anne's going to talk to us and lead a discussion about habits. When you're talking about the fresh start, that's a really fun place to start. And it is actually, believe it or not, completely coincidental we're doing this after the first of the year, but perfect timing. Yeah, it is great timing. Because by now, by the time this airs, everybody will have already started their fresh start and have failed. <laughs> right. They will or, all have purchased their gym memberships right. or that they've or their never yoga used. Mat that will then sit in their closet. So, uh, yeah. And the, you know what's so fun about that is that, you know, that part of us that is doing the new start is a wonderful part of us. It's actually this part of us that's, that's activated in our system by all these really great things. And it's that part that wants to be our better best self, that higher order. And the research on that is kind of interesting because when we feel like we're going to have a fresh start, our motivation is very high, but our realism is the lowest. It is the lowest time that we have a realistic assessment. If you think about it, an example would be, well, like you said, Patty, you know, when you're thinking about the diet in the middle of Saturday night and you're really enjoying yourself and you're thinking on Monday, I'm going to start. And you're not thinking about the obstacles. You're not thinking about the dinner you have on Wednesday with friends at the Mexican restaurant. You're in the middle of gluttony. Guacamole. (laughs) Tortilla chips. You're in the middle of enjoying yourself. And you're going, hey, you know, I'm going to start that on Monday. Motivation high. And you really believe it. I mean, Of course. You're committed. Yeah. Yeah, it's, It's really intensely admirable and intentional. And you think you've made a decision. And yet when Monday comes, because you haven't been very realistic and you have all the obstacles in front of you, and you think, I'm freshly started. And by Wednesday, those obstacles that you have unrealistically forgotten about hit you. And therein lies our human nature. So one of the things I want to talk about with that is what is our biggest obstacle to doing it? What is the obstacle that creates that lack of realism? So part of what you're saying is on Saturday when Patty is um, imbibing in her Fonda San Miguel <laughs> dinner and saying on Monday, I am going to have a fresh start and I'm going to really eat my Mediterranean healthy diet, diet and uh, do my exercise four times a five week times exercise. a week. And- You're going to do five? Wow, oh, that's sorry. pretty impressive. That part of the problem is that she's not accurately weighing in, that like there's an over optimism. And there's not an accurate representation of the obstacles that she's going to face, that she had faced last week. Right. That are just the real obstacles, like the tortilla chips. Well, and let's talk about the reason for that. And part of that is that when we're making that more active, romantic decision on our, our, our new self. That's a great word. <laughs> on our new selves. What's, well, well, the part That's the first date. <laughs> <laughs> We, we're using an area of our brain that's, it really literally is our higher order brain. If we're using our, to make those fanciful thoughts, we're using, we're using our prefrontal cortex, that higher brain that we talk about. Uh-huh. And yet what's really in control 
of, I can't give you the exact percentage, somebody could, of almost all of our behavior isn't that part of our brain. What's really running the show is that part of our brain that's much more interior to us that is habituated and that teaches us to brush our teeth in the morning. It, it's the one that activates our habits. And that is actually what's running the show much more than our prefrontal cortex. And it has to be that way. Is this related to that rat study that you talked about? Yes, actually, it's exactly that. Uh, some researchers in MIT, pretty recently, this is just the last couple of years, which is exciting, trying to understand habits and that what happens in the brain when we overlearn something. And that's what a habit is. We've overlearned it. And what they did is they... Re- I've, I've overlearned tortilla chips and guacamole. <laughs> <laughs> You're a high achiever. <laughs> I'm very good at it. Yes. <laughs> So what they did is they put rats in a maze and they were able to watch their activity in their brain and they taught them a new thing. They taught them to go down this little T and when they, they heard it, first of all, they hear a little tone and that tells them to go. And then as they go down, they hear another tone and that tells them to go left or right. And they go left, they might get chocolate milk, they go right and get sugar water. But both of them, very rewarding. And so what they discovered is, not surprisingly, when the first bell, the cue goes off, They get a big old dopamine hit, and then they're traveling down the maze, and they get another cue, and now that you see all this activity in the brain... So they're thinking. They're thinking. They're making a decision. They're learning, and you can see that they're learning because you can see the areas of the brain that are lighting up, and then as they continue to learn and think and they they end up getting the reward, they get another dopamine hit. And so what we're learning uh, is that much of our life, actually, (laughs) we think it's this higher order thinking. But really, we're all little dopamine addicts in some level. That's the thing that trains us. It trains us to be motivated in the world. It trains us to learn how to survive. And so these rats learn this, and you can see them learning. But what distinguishes the learning from a habit? What's that in? Well, and that is after the the research at MIT, they taught them to, they overlearned it. They did it hundreds and hundreds of times. And one of the things they started noticing is a concept that you would call chunking, is that is they, the bell would go off, they'd get their dopamine hit. But what you noticed is the activity in the middle of the area of the certain... They no everything, longer thought. No longer thinking. <laughs> you see a serious decline in their decision making. So I know the guacamole is super fattening. <laughs> exactly. But I no longer think and I still pound it. That is actually incredibly true. <laughs> because you're not thinking. But we trick ourselves. We think we're thinking because we're aware. We're watching ourselves, but you're not thinking. Well, we're, it's like the smoker that after 10 years, they don't even taste good. No. You don't even like them. You hate the way your hair smells. You hate the way your clothes smell, but you keep smoking the cigarettes. What's well, interesting you should say that, Patty, because an interesting part of the study is once they realized that they weren't thinking very much and they could see that they had just habituated, they were just running, to know that it was a habit instead of just a goal is they changed one of them. And when they went to go get that reward, it actually made them nauseous. They paired it with nausea. Oh, And so you would think, okay, gosh, I'm going to go down there when I get nauseous. No way, I'm not going that way. But guess what? Those little old rats went down and they got the nauseous because they had learned it. When they were told to go it right. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. And it didn't I think, matter if my cigarettes taste <laughs> awful or smell awful. It didn't matter. They're not even aware. They just go get it because they've learned it. Totally relate. <laughs> you can relate. Over learning right. it. So as our listeners are listening to this, I wonder if you all can relate to something that you do that you know is bad for you. Just like the little rats running down the little maze and you hear the little ding. And you're like, I know if I turn right, I'm going to be gonna really suck. nauseous. <laughs> but here I go, turn right, <laughs> go, <laughs> to go drink the little nauseous juice. Because we always have Monday and we can start again. <laughs> <laughs> and get that dopamine hit. <laughs> exactly. So let me tell you some interesting things about this research. And I think they did a beautiful job. I was really impressed with it. And that is, so once they overlearned it and they could keep getting nauseous because it's a habit, they just kept doing it. Well, they decided to get a little fancy in this. And what they've done is they haven't, they have... I won't get completely nerdy nerdy on you, and we'll, we'll have it in the show notes. But they were able to learn through a special technique to light up a certain area of the prefrontal cortex of the brain. And in doing that, when they stimulated that one area, the habit completely disappeared. Wow. So you're probably asking yourself. I want that. Where's that area, and how do I get it stimulated? <laughs> well, stick with us, and I'm going to talk about it. 
right? It might not be quite as easy as turning a light on, at least not yet. They have hopes. I want an electrode. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the infralimbic cortex that gets stimulated, and it's it's online, and when they stimulated, that habit disappeared, like that. And then they got the cues, and instead of just going to the nauseous thing, they thought, hey, quit that. And they started going towards the reward, and you started seeing decision-making, and you started getting rewards, and now we're back in the learning process. Okay, so now the interesting thing about that, but about a week later, what they do is they activate that same area of the infralimbic cortex, and guess what happens? The habit comes immediately back. You mean they stop activating it? No, they, what they did is they, they end up lighting that area up. So it's like an on-off switch. The first time they hit it, it went off. The second time they hit it, it went back on. And so when they re-stimulated that area, that habit immediately came back. And they would go back for the nauseous activity and the brain activity. So within. sort of what you're saying, Ann, is that if we apply this to people, once you develop a bad habit, whether it be chips and guacamole or smoking or, you know, too much screen time or whatever it is, that you can unlearn it or you can introduce something new, but that with the wrong stimulation, it's always going to be there. Once you've really deeply gotten a groove, it's just going to be there. Right. And that we can train ourselves to move out of it. That's really depressing. Why are you telling us this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and all right. Don't turn it off. Don't turn it off. Some hope for us. Come here. on. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about that area in humans because we're not really that interested in rat studies and how it applies to us. All right. Well, let's yeah. be hopeful. Yes. Let's be hopeful. And um, Jeffrey Schwartz made a parallel to another body of research that I want to bring in that I also found fascinating. And that is that exact area in humans. Um, so we're saying, how do we activate that in humans? That's what we would all be asking. That's what I was asking. And that same area in humans is actually an area of the brain that it taps into our value system and that it is the area that... So even- instead of having an electrode... Exactly. The electrode in humans is thinking about our value system. Well, it's it's the part of our. It's not even just the top. It's a part of our free frontal prefrontal cortex that holds evaluation, and it holds those things that say this is valuable to me and relevant to me. And when you give something to, like what? What when you give something? Well, there's another study that that is brought into this is that when they put humans in an MRI and they have them actually stimulate that part and they ask them what values do you hold what is really 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 important to you and you so get- before you before you say what it is as a listener out there in the world what is really really important to you and just let yourself think about that for a moment how does it relate to the thing you're wanting to change? Because usually we're wanting to change something and we promise ourselves because it's really, really valuable to us and that our motivating system knows that. And yet, because we go into the autopilot, we go into the auto process that doesn't involve that part of us and that is so well trained, even if it's bad for us, that we lose access to that part of our brain because it's the other part of our brain that's more dominant. And so the interesting thing in the humans about that part of the brain is it's the part that activates our value system. And honestly, it's also the part that gets activated when we get highly stressed. So Anne, what happened when they stimulated that in the humans? I haven't read anything about them actually learning to stimulate it as they did in the rat. How they did with values, I'll tell you about the research on that one. And that is they had humans in an MRA and they had them that were typically not very active and they gave them health research. They gave them an article on health and changing and becoming active and how important that was and they had them read it and then they watched the brain activity and then they looked to see whether there was any actual behavior change and in those that they just put them in the MRI and they gave them the material and they had them read it and then guess what? Who would predict did it lead to behavioral change? No. No. Right. We all know we're supposed to do yoga and Tai Chi and meditate. And run a mile a, a day. Three miles. <laughs> a day? Okay. <laughs> Who doesn't know that, right? Right. We know what is good for us. We're not shocked. We don't need help knowing what to promise ourselves on Monday. We already have an ice. Right. Day. The tone goes, we know we're supposed to turn right, but we turn left to the chips and guacamole. Exactly. No and, matter how and Mexican Mrs. martini. <laughs> <laughs> But in the uh, other subjects, what they did is they put them in our MRI. And before they handed them the exact same pieces of information, they said, I want you to get in touch with something that's very valuable. What is your value? What is your core, your deepest part of your value? And they had them talk about that. They had them get in touch with that area, which activated that part of the brain. And then they had them read the exact same research. And the study outcome is it led to behavioral change. Wow. So... Even talking about my values turns that switch on or off. That's the electrode. Exactly. And you're talking about it. And the thing that's interesting when you look at another body of research is that 
what gets activated? I talked a lot about dopamine, right? And what is dopamine? Dopamine is our hit system. It's survival. It tells us how to, you know, why would we want to procreate and have these little kids that are hard for us to take care of, right? We get a little dopamine, we get oxytocin, we get rewarded for those things that keep us alive. And that's very, very important. But if you think about what gets activated more, so when, when you have a want and you're thinking about, I want food, I, I want those guacamole, you're actually in activating a dopamine system and a stress level that actually creates more wanting. But when you get in touch with your value, that's why when you think about Monday or you think about your New Year's resolution, think about it right now. Think, what do I want to change? And get in touch with that feeling. What are you yearning for in your values? How are you yearning to have your life go? And you get in touch with that and imagine how you feel. And one of the reasons you feel motivated is that actually activates a different level of system, including a little bit more of an opiate effect, a natural endogenous opiate effect in your body. And as you do that, that's a more satiating, motivating chemical to be inducing. It actually helps you fill up. And so you get that moment of, oh, I'm going to be that valuable individual that I aspire to be. And I'm also getting a chemical response that's quite calming and and helps you sort of feel more at peace and wanting, more satiated. Right. So it's like better drugs. (laughs) <laughs> well you know it's better than the guacamole well you know what better than the dopamine too well and dopamine's good it's for survival but i I've, I've always promised at some point i'm going to write a book that says become your own drug dealer but everybody says that wouldn't go over really well but it's kind of what we're talking about what drug do you want to induce in your body dopamine's essential it's wonderful so opiates oxytocin but i think the thing that's really really important and you asked patty how do we get to the how to's well we're already touching on that like if you think about those things that we typically want to get rid of or we want to change if you think about it it's often related to survival it's related to food drink sex belonging these things that we actually need and we talk about in our podcast these are all really really highly related to our survival but we don't really need to fight for them anymore and so we're still motivated by them we get dopamine hits about them but they take over our system and we automate those and so one of the things to suggest we develop what some people call soft addictions so part of our system is why our habits become so addictive why are we going for sometimes it's food sometimes it's comfort i want to sit on the couch instead of go to the gym because i want comfort and warmth. And so we develop what we call soft addictions. And those are addictions. They're very habituated. We're not thinking too hard about them. And yet we continue to do them over and over and over again. And so what I want to talk about is how to shift that. Let me back up. One of the things I promised is we were going to talk about what is a good habit and what's a bad because habits are good, right? We need to know how to brush our teeth in the morning. We need to know how to get to work without thinking, right? If everything we did in our world, we had to actually do a lot of decision-making and thinking, we'd be in trouble. Right. Right. So one of the things we had talked about was this idea, you you had earlier talked about chunking and automation, and that I so love some of these points that you're making, and I think they're so relevant to people's real life. So I think this is some of where you're going, but like bad habits and good habits, and again, I think of the rat running down the little thing, and like, do I go right or do I go left? So I think some of what you're saying is when there's no cognition and it's a bad habit, that's bad. So if I turn right and I'm going to get nauseous and I don't think about it, bad idea. And if I want to do a good thing and have a good habit and I'm not incorporating the real obstacles, that's a bad idea. So my uptake in what that I think that the, I guess the advice or the how-to would be if it's a bad habit that you're doing, we want to insert a gap and begin to think about what you're doing and tie it into your higher values. And then if it's a good habit you're wanting to introduce that we want to not have a gap and automate it and over-practice it and make it automatic and just make it be the non-thought about habit that you're not, you know what I mean, that is over-practiced and that you just do. Like I'm going to... Brushing your teeth, flossing your teeth. Or Patty's going to work out five days a week when not think about it and not worry about it. Yeah, I think the dilemma is when you're trying to stop the bad habit and start the good. Yes, that's a really good, that's exactly what we're talking about is in part of the ways to do that. And when you think about what is it that you're wanting to stop, you know, when I think about a bad habit, it's something that's not very adaptive for us and we know it, you know, and a good habit is something we know is really adaptive and good for us. If we think about those habits on our side that are automatic, the goal would be to insert some thinking, some decision making so that it's exactly it. So when Patty's thinking about it on Monday and she's thinking, I really want that guacamole. That no, I'm the guacamole. Oh, you're the guacamole. <laughs> <laughs> we can arm wrestle over it. <laughs> over our bad habits. <laughs> so to sum up, the, to, to deal with a bad habit, because a bad habit is generally automated, 
it's that element that you want to bring in that prefrontal deliberation. cortex. Yeah, you, you want, want to deliberate. You need to slow it down because it's so automated. And the, the thing is, we are aware of it. Yeah, you want to reintroduce cognition. Yes. That's what's missing is that there's not the moral, higher value element. And that's what I heard you saying, Anne, was this, uh, that the people who read and like were connected to like what I really want in life. And I don't necessarily want to sit for five hours and play Game of Thrones. I guess that's not a game. Yes, it is. Oh, it's a TV show. Or, you know, whatever. War of the world. War of the world. I I don't want to necessarily do that. I end up doing that. Or I don't want to. Oh, oh, here we go. Netflix, right? Like sometimes I want to binge on Netflix and watch, you know. uh, Orange is the new black. Okay. Orange is the new. Breaking bad. Breaking bad. 12 episodes of that. But. If I don't want to actually do that, which sometimes that's a great idea, fantastic idea, but other times that's not such a great idea. And so between episodes, I want to stop and get up and walk around and really think that, you know, I need to feed my cat and do the laundry and clean up the house and call my mom and, you know what I mean? Like do my other things. Exactly. You want to stop. Do the values, the other values. Well, one is if you can get in touch with the values, like with the soft addictions, if you can go, what is it that I'm needing when I'm picking up my phone to check my text or my social media 15 times in an hour? What is it that I'm really looking for? I might be looking for belonging. That's a good thing. But, you know, the problem is, is that we actually are aware. It's not like we're not aware we're breaking our diet on Monday. Right? Oh, yeah, and we just don't care. We just don't care. So how do you actually implement and, and care? As Patty's smoking. She's like, just <laughs> right. doesn't give a I, crap. I want our <laughs> listeners to know I quit at 21. <laughs> <laughs> don't want you to y'all, think I'm Y'all still realize smoking. our two examples were Breaking Bad and Orange is the New Black, <laughs> which are totally antisocial. <laughs> I think that probably says something. In research on smoking, one of the things I've talked about is that there's so, it actually so automated, you're not even as aware of how bad the taste is. Exactly. So you quit at 21. I'm wondering how aware you were at 20, how bad it tasted. No, but I will tell you that many years later, I went horseback riding, which I had not done for years. And I had historically gone horseback riding with a friend and we would stop and have a cigarette. So even though I hadn't been smoking for years and years, I get on a horse. The first thing I want is a A cigarette. cigarette. Yeah. That area of that brain, you were ready to go again. So inserting, and and I love what you said, Sue, that one of the things is to insert what I would call a wise advocate. And I'm borrowing that term and I love it. And it's because we have an awareness that we're, we're doing whatever it is we're doing. It's not like we're unaware, but a wise advocate. And trying to make that wise advocate a non-shaming, not whacking yourself, but really do call yourself out. And one of the suggestions, even use your name because you get yourself, what you have to do is you have to bring yourself. Sue, don't eat the guacamole. (laughs) (laughs) Because if you don't, you'll say, oh, I'm not going to eat this. I don't want, I'm going to eat the guacamole. I'll start tomorrow. And what I usually say is like, I've worked really hard. I deserve this guacamole. Exactly. (laughs) That's how you know it's a habit. It's when you're justifying doing it. So if I was going to be your wise advocate, Sue, I would say, pretend like you're being your own best friend. Sue, you know you want that, but you know you're just giving yourself in to one more Monday start. It's like calling yourself out. Yeah. Like I like that I'll quit tomorrow. It's like just that tomorrow never comes. And you have to say, when I say I'm going to start on Monday, it's kind of BS. So start on Sunday because on Sunday, it's actually much more realistic than starting on, on the new start on or Monday. Or I'll just, I'm going to start right this second. Well, and the thing is, because what you're doing when you say the second is you're making a decision. And the interesting thing- right, Versus punting. Right. Like, I, it's just no matter what, I'm not starting right now. Right. And when you decide to start on Monday, you then give yourself permission to do the bad habit a whole lot between now and well, Monday. Well, that's what I mean. That's what the punt is. It's like no matter what, I'm okay now, it, whether it's Sunday or Monday exactly. or whatever, versus I'm going to start the second is like I'm actually serious about what I'm going to do. Right. Well, Anna, you're making a decision. And actually, when you, there is a lot of, reward and chemical rewards when we make a decision. When we're actually really, really decisive and we make a decision, we actually get a lot of hits on that. Yeah. And you know, like some people say like, oh, it's so hard. You know, what do you mean I can't eat grains? One of the things that helped me was somebody who just said, 
Are you serious? You think that's hard? That's not hard. You know, what's hard is losing a child. What's hard is like they were, they began naming these things that were actually hard and, and it just humbled me and it was like an appropriate use of shame. And I was like, oh my God, that's so true. You know, these privileged things of like, oh, giving up some small thing. That's not hard. And I I found it really inspiring and empowering. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's like a minor inconvenience and it makes me uh, mildly discomfort have some mild discomfort and I'm aware that I have a high intolerance to mild discomfort. That's actually what the truth is. Yeah. And that, that would be a wonderful way to be a wise advocate to yourself. Like exactly. Use that friend's voice. That was what it was. That was right. totally true. Not only do we have aversion to discomfort, that's the part where you were mentioning earlier. And that is when you're trying to maintain a good habit, a good habit is hard. It has all this thinking in it. And all this thinking is to divert you over to the what's more primitive. And so that is the point if you don't want to have deliberation in that, because what happens when we deliberate? Like, okay. We'll put it off. Um, personally, like if I stop, I, I'm part of a gym right now that kicks my butt. And what I have to do is, one, automate it. I need to set up a cue immediately so that I know what I'm doing and I don't have any thinking. Right. So you set it up. I'm gonna. You don't say, I'm going to lose weight or I'm going to get in shape. You say, I'm going to go to the gym at 8, you know, at 6.15 every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. And I set it up so it's no thinking because if I stop and I wake up and I start going, do I want to go to the gym? And then I start imagining myself in that workout and I start thinking my, about the, my discomfort. Well, you can see the more I start doing that, the more my deliberation goes and I start seeking the comfort. Well, and I want us to pause for a moment to have a little bit of a reward, which is that we do this because it's really fulfilling and it's really something that's a gift from our heart to our listeners. And we are really grateful that we have a new sponsor who's going to help us do this. The sponsor is Theranest. They provide practice management software for thousands of therapists, and they've put together a special offer that's available for our listeners. If you go to our website at therapistuncensored.com, you'll see their ad, and just click that ad, and it'll take you to their website, and they've put together a quite a delightful offering for our listeners. That's right. So for the listeners that are therapists, it's a great thing to check out. You get a really substantial discount on the first three months. So does everybody feel motivated for their new selves? Well, my favorite part of this is, you know, that whole thing about the habituation and the chunking and really trying to break apart the chunks and add thinking to the bad habits and then stopping thinking for the good habits. So that, so my example would be that like if I slow down me going to the gym or if I think, well, I'll do it after Mm. breakfast or I'll do it after work or I'll later I'll do it or basically anything I put in front of it is going to lower the chances of me doing it and I'll have more excuses or what have you versus if it's the other way around which is say it's a bad habit like I don't want to overuse the example but just for sake of whatever my chips and guacamole if I'm like oh there's a little Mexican stand I'm going to stop there oh no okay I'm not going to stop at that corner I'll stop at the next corner and I get past the one corner and I'm going to go to the next corner I'm like okay no 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 I'm going to get home, and if I still want chips and guacamole, I'll go home, I'll change clothes, and then I'll go out for chips. You see what I'm saying? That like I will You're putting in- that gap in I there. will insert gaps into the bad habit. Well, and, and that's lovely. And change the cues. Like if you're really aware and you make a decision and just try one or two habits, there's signature habits. Like you change one habit and it could change a lot. You don't try to do too many. But if you really want to change that one habit, Really change your cues. And so you don't go that way home. You change it. The part I love about this is it gives us control. Because lots of times it feels like the habits control us. Oh, mm-hmm. man, another truth. And to have some idea of what can I do to make this, you know, work for my benefit. So listeners, I want you to all think about what are your automated behaviors that aren't serving you and how can you insert gaps into your chunked automated behaviors to use this language. Don't be the rat that runs right when the tone sounds 
and drinks the nauseating water um, just because it's a habit. Let's not be that primitive. Let's be smarter. Insert the habit. At least create a pause. At least create a gap. You still get to drink the nauseating water if you really want to, but it, it gives you a chance to do something else. So and to then, insert and then, that pause. And then not just to insert the pause, but what we want to put in the pause is yes. what Ann talked about is like, think about your higher values. Really, really put some time in to think about what you really want in your life and what's missing and what this habit is doing to you, why it's a bad habit. You know, we're not judging, whatever. You get to do whatever you want with your life. But why do you think it's a bad habit? And if it is, why? And what would you prefer to do? And really tie it into morality and your integrity and your vision of yourself that you really believe in and put that in the gap that you're going to create and then see what happens. And then at the same time, on the other side, what would you like to do instead? And let's just see where that goes. We wish you the best of luck. Thank you for listening all the way through. We really, really appreciate our audience and we would love to hear from you. And we would especially love it if you would share the podcast, subscribe to your favorite podcast platform, sign up for our email list and come back for more. Take care. We'll see you around the bend. Therapist Uncensored is Ann Kelly, Patty Allwell, and Sue Marriott. Cameron Lindsay edits the show. <laughs>